This is day five of J.K. Heisman's The Crowds of Lourdes. We had to have a temporary break because I had to travel to visit my mother who was in the hospital. So it's kind of curious to see how in the midst of this, and I finished the book there, how one can pray for miracles, one can desire the best, but miracles don't always happen. So uh, that always depends on God and Our Lady and what Divine Providence wants. And you'll see here, many times we have a variety of situations where Heisman himself is very afflicted to see what he sees and would wish that everybody, if you will, is cured, but they not necessarily will be. We're going to go into the hospital at Lourdes. Actually, it's a new hospital of Our Lady of Sorrows. The new hospital of Notre Dame des Sept Dolores is a huge, unfinished building. Such as it is, manages to harbor the multitude of patients that crowded into it. They sleep on all sides, even in the rooms lately begun. Separated from the open air by mere wooden partitions. And they also eat everywhere, even in the yards over which tarpaulins have been stretched and in sheds in which the number of boards have been put upon trestles. And here is what is really extraordinary. Amidst all the uproar of camp life, amidst the influx and reflux of the coming and going of sick cases, arriving and departing with the pilgrimages to which they belong, in this constant promiscuity of people from every country, many of whom do not even understand French, their reign of friendly discipline and perfect order. The food is well cooked and punctually served. All who cannot feed themselves are helped. Priests are at the beck and call of the bedridden who want to make their confessions. Stretcher bearers are ever ready to carry them to the grotto and to bring them back. The entrance of the hospital has no pomposity about it. In the court before it, behind the railings that cut it off from the street, is a bivouac of ambulances. At the moment, all have just come back from the grotto. The stretcher bearers, broken with fatigue now that the patients have been taken to their beds, are lying at full length in their places on the cushions and are talking as they smoke with others who are coming and going. The ward on the right side is reserved for women and it wrecks your heart as soon as you enter it. It is crammed with beds packed closely together, and in them lie motionless women with their eyes closed, and yet not asleep, for they open them with a sudden scared look, and then shut them again. What haggard and bloodless faces! What a look of weariness of everything and of sickness of life, of hazy hope and of fear! and the wretchedness of their parcels, the poverty of their rags, and the cardboard packets of their two-penny, half-penny handbags heaped up near their beds, adds pity for their material distress to one's compassion for these poor creatures. Here one raises herself suddenly and seized with the hiccups, throws up mouthfuls of blood while a lady runs to support her and wipes her lips with a napkin. There another utters a short cry in a hoarse voice and rises, while they hurry round her and moisten her temples, making her inhale smelling salts and assuring her that her torments will soon be over and that the Virgin will cure her. In the front row on the counterpane of an undisturbed bed with her head propped up upon two pillows, lies a strange figure, fully dressed, but with her feet hidden under a pad of wadding. An old lady sitting near this young girl, or rather child, tells me her harrowing story. The little girl has gangrene in both feet. They decided to send her to Lourdes, but no one would stay in the carriage with her. So fetid was the odor of her ulcers. Pus was so abundant as to break through all her linen dressings, and a bucket 
had to be placed under her. Her sufferings were so acute that her cries drowned the train whistles. And at one time, this good lady, not knowing how to relieve her, and having agreed to remain in the compartment alone with her, undid her dressings and put her feet out of the window, so to cool them in the fresh air. The poor child was taken out at Lourdes without being able to have them wrapped up again, for the least touch made her scream. She took her first bath in the piscina this morning, and one minute afterwards the sores dried up and became painless. She now endures, and without feeling it, this layer of wadding, and the lady lifts it up and says, Look, sir, and on her feet, which were no longer, or not yet feet, I saw two dull red sponges, but dry sponges. There was neither matter, nor blood, nor smell. There was nothing of any kind. And after a few more baths, our lady will cure her altogether said the lady with a smile. I look at the child and vainly seek to discover what she's thinking. Her expression is taciturn and appears to suggest an inward shrinking. The eyes are speaking, but what are they saying? They tell of infinite resignation, of a sort of indifference about herself. They are both far away and grieving, and above all, very grave. Is she lost in God, or only stupefied by the sudden change from intolerable suffering to a most sweet repose? I cannot tell. On the other hand, what a delightful person is this little old woman! How refined and distinguished, and how devoted to her sick charge! At her advanced age, she has undergone the fatigue of a long journey to help this poor cripple for life. Not of her own station, whom she hardly knows at all, and she tells you about it all so simply. She thinks what she has done is so natural that you are really touched to hear her. She asks me to come and see her protege again and to pray for her. Yes, indeed, anything you will, dear good Samaritan. Good Abbe Daho, one of the chaplains who acts as the chaplain of the hospital, fetches me to assist at meals of the sick. Here I am back in the corridors in which ladies are running to and fro, some to empty basins, others to bring back bowls of soup, and here they are summoning stretcher bearers to help up an impotent man who is too heavy. And there one of them pulls up to the chaplain to tell him that the bedridden patient she is in charge of is about to die. It is time to give him extra unction. So we go to see her patient and the chaplain, accustomed as he is to the appearances assumed by the dying, reassures the lady, whose sad face relaxes. And there is a continual coming and going amidst the conversations of those who stop the way everywhere with their talks. However, at last we get free from the crowd and come to the great refectory. It is so full that the guests are packed together at table like a barrel of fish, elbow wedged into elbow, Young girls and ladies in fresh, clean dresses beneath their aprons are helping everyone with a plate of soup, a slice of mutton, and hahiko beans, and are pouring out wine from stoneware jugs into the glasses, adding a dash of water to it. There are all sorts of people in the dining hall, adorned with nothing but a crucifix. There are sick folks who look quite well and lunch with an appetite and others just nibble, their deeply lined faces betraying the persistence of disease. There are others again with their heads swathed deftly in linen bandages, doubtless concealing swellings or sores, and others heaving up and down goiters which keep time to the working of their jaws while they eat. And yet the affections seen here are only such as are presentable. And the same things are to be met in the shed outside. There the Belgian colony has installed itself, and all around the tables, blonde young women with white caps are talking and laughing and enlivening the afflicted as they wait on them. A little farther on beneath stretched tarpaulins, there is an encamp 
treatment of ambulances of sick cases, whom ladies are helping to spoonfuls of morsels of food. And lastly, in the courtyard, in a sort of waste ground, is the side table of monstrosities. The leonine and mealy jaws which one might have hoped would have disappeared with the wear and tear of past ages are to be once more discovered there. Here are lepers sitting cheek by jowl alongside tumorous necks from the uplands. And here are women suffering from lupus who, if they raise their black veils, exhibit death's heads with two red holes for eyes and a bleeding trefoil instead of a nose. Others who are eaten up with cancer of the face have only half of their faces left, and that any liquid he takes may not run away, escaping through the screen of his perforated palate, one poor creature is obliged to fling his head backwards and pinch his nose in order to drink. In another corner, a man suffering from adenitis swells out to the girth of a pumpkin from his ear down to his neck. Under the weight, his head bends over, and he swallows his quantum leaning down on the one side. But in this Cour des Miracles, there are worse things still. A peasant belonging to the pilgrimage from Coutances is taking his lunch by himself with his face to the wall like a punished child. And now he turns round to ask for bread. Oh! From a shapeless and slimy hole, which was once a mouth, hangs an enormous tongue. The slack and violet-colored skin which covers it like a coating of gum is apparently dead. But it moves and is alive inside. The man's cheek and hair on them drop down, but his chin is where? How can he swallow? And yet he masticates this meat, but in secret, for his tongue, full of an indescribable something that shakes about, is dropping with a lupus. Dear Lord, remember in spite of this that thou, in order to redeem us, Disclose thyself with the livery of flesh, if it be only for the sake of man's wretched body that thou hast sanctified by taking it upon thyself. Have mercy on this man and heal him. We'll leave it there for today.